Let's talk party popper science, but the real ones, not these fake spring ones. Although we could think of the energy in the molecules as being kind of like springs that we can either, um, we can take really tight springs, uh, like really high energy bonds, and we can break them and instead form um, stronger, lower energy bonds. In the process, we're releasing energy. We can re use this energy to shoot off the um, confetti. So let's talk about how it works. Okay, so these are the type of party poppers that I'm talking about. These like champagne party poppers where you pull the string and then all this like confetti shoots out. Yeah, so this was uh, the last time I've actually had a real one was a couple years ago, uh, pre-pandemic times, and my mom took this picture. So I really love it, even though it looked really funny. But anyway, what's going on when you pull the string? Um, and so basically, this string around this string, there's actually wrapped a teeny tiny pit of this um, like gunpowder like stuff. And what's going to happen is that it's unreactive as it is. You need to put in a little like energy um, in order to get things going. Um, and you do this by when you pull the string, um, it's going to create friction because it's this like um, this reaction mixture. It's called like Armstrong's mixture. It's basically um, wrapped around this. Um, it's like on this string and the paper and the paper's all rolled up around it. So when you're pulling the string, you're creating friction. What this friction does is it's going to do a couple things that we'll look at um, in a bit of detail later. Um, it's going to basically free up some of this phosphorus um, and free up some of the oxygen. Um, and so this is going to allow the phosphorus and the oxygen to interact. The oxygen is going to oxidize the phosphorus and this is going to give off energy that's going to keep um, driving this process um, and giving off more and more energy. You're also creating a gas. Um, and so basically when you have this energy, you have this like entropy. So basically we'll talk more about what these terms mean, but you have a lot more freedom in your molecules. And so you can use this energy to basically um, shoot out this confetti. And so the champagne poppers, they're basically the shape of it um, is designed so that it's kind of like orienting the force of all of the energy that you're generating to like directing it so that it shoots the confetti out away from you. Um, and so, yeah, so don't, um, I'm not endorsing um, taking apart these poppers because um, you're not technically supposed to, but um, this is what is inside them if you were to cut it, them open, um, which you should not do. Okay, so what's actually going on? Um, so this is what we call a redox reaction, so uh, an oxidation and reduction reaction. Um, so we've talked a lot about these before, and we'll talk a little bit more about them um, in a bit. Um, but this, the key thing about this reaction is that it is exergonic. Like overall, it's exergonic, which means it releases energy. Um, and so this has to do with thermodynamics. So when we say that some, a reaction is exergonic, when we say that a reaction releases energy, what we're saying is that the reaction is spontaneous. But well, as we'll see, this does not mean that it's instantaneous or, and it does not mean that it's likely. Um, and so basically you have to um, put in some activation energy in order to get the reaction to start. Um, you have to get past some like some in transition state. And so you can have this, in this activation energy. Um, you have to put in that activation energy in order to get the reaction to occur, even if the products are a lot more favorable than the reactants. You can also have like, linked reactions, um, which is, as this is an example in what we're seeing. Like, so when we look at, when we look at like this reaction, this isn't happening like all at once. Basically, we first need to break down this potassium chlorate. To do this, we actually need to put in energy. So this step is like endergonic, it takes energy. But overall, the reaction is exergonic. Um, it gives off energy. And so basically, we're using some of um, the energy we give off in order to fuel this and keep it going. Um, and so we can provide activation energy and stuff in that way. And we can make reactions go that even if they are not exergonic, so even if they're not thermodynamically favorable, we can keep them going by providing the energy that they need in order to happen. 
whether a reaction gives off energy or not, so whether a reaction is exergonic, meaning it gives off energy, um, and is what we call spontaneous, or whether it is endergonic, so it takes in, it requires energy, it's non-spontaneous. This is, we can describe with this, um, term delta G. Um, so this is the Gibbs free energy. And so the delta is because it's a change in free energy between the products and the reactants. You can think about if you had, say, a, um, a ball on the top of a hill. The ball is going to roll down the hill, right? When it rolls down the hill, it's not just going to like spontaneously roll back up. So when it's up here, it has high potential energy. So it has the potential to like fall down. Um, and um, so energy, it allows you to do work to move things. Um, and so basically you can think of the ball as being higher, it has high energy. When it drops down, now it has low energy. Um, and so this is like, this would be kinetic potential energy. And when we're talking about molecules and stuff, we can think of chemical um, potential energy. But basically, if your reactants have a lot higher product, um, if your reactants have a higher energy than your products, then what's going to happen is your delta G energy of your products minus the energy of the reactants is going to be negative. So del negative delta G is going to mean that the reaction is exergonic. But if you had your products had more energy than the reactants, so if we were to flip this, basically what we're saying is we're going to need to push the ball up the ramp. So we're going to require energy to do this. And I mean, you would rather, if you were at, you would rather like probably rather like slide ski down a slope then climb back up it right and so similarly a reaction is going to be more favorable if it can kind of slide down that chemical energy um difference and so if your products have a um higher energy than your reactants then it's going to be unfavorable you're going to have a positive delta g and you're going to be non-spontaneous um, and also just a quick note, we're going to get into the spontaneous does not mean likely because you might have to put in like some activation energy in order to get it to happen. Um, because instead of being like this, things are really more like you have some sort of transition state you have to get past. And so there's an activation energy. Um, so this, it's not like a reaction is going to like instantaneously happen or it might not even be likely to happen. And just because something's non-spontaneous doesn't mean it's impossible because if you give it a little energy, you can get it to go. So what's going to determine whether a reaction is spontaneous or not? So it has to do with the chemical properties of the things as well as the environment that they're in. Um, so it's going to depend on um, the energy of the various bonds. Um, and so this is re reflected in this term called enthalpy or H, um, as well as this term called entropy or S, which is basically like how ran like randomness or disorder. So how much can the molecules like move around um, and that sort of thing. So I like to think of this like thermodynamics as kind of like couch shopping. Um, so if you think about, you're trying to determine, you're on a couch and it's, um, you're trying to determine if you should go and get and go over to a different couch. So in the, so in the end, like basically from a thermodynamic perspective, we're saying, okay, so if we were to look at the change of free energy, are you happier in your current couch or would you be happier in the other couch? If you're happier in the other couch, then it would be an exergon of reaction. There would be a negative delta G. It would be a favor thermodynamically favorable decision for you to go to move to that other couch. But of course you have to get up and move to that other couch and that's where the activation co energy comes in. And that's why the reactions, that thermodynamics doesn't necessarily mean that a reaction is going to happen um, in that sort of thing. Um, but let's talk about why the one couch might be better than another. So we can talk about it in terms of these entropy and enthalpy. We can think about these in terms of our couch analogy. So entropy is kind of like how much energy do you, I mean, how much room do you have to spread out? So I'm guessing that you would probably prefer to have more room to spread out on your couch, right? If you have more room to spread out, then you can like be spread out in different ways. So one way to think of entropy is kind of like the number of different like states 
micro states that you can be in or whatever. So you can be like this, you can be like this, you can be like this. And so you can see that now if you were to look, you'd see at a bunch of different molecules in that same couch or whatever, you would see a bunch of different orientations that things would seem more random or disordered. So basically nature likes entropy. That's one of um, these like thermodynamic laws. Um, and so the more entropy, the better. Um, and so if you have um, in our couch analogy, if we can spread out more, that's better. Um, then we have the question of enthalpy. So basically the enthalpy is going to refer to like the heat, the bond energy. Um, um, and so basically, if you have, if you're more comfy, um, then you're like less squirmy, right? So you can think about like bonds that are higher energy um, as kind of being like you're more squirmy on your couch. Like the couch is, is um, it's harder to get comfortable on that couch. You're more squirmy, you have more energy. So we can talk about like high energy bonds and we're talking about like high chemical potential energy bonds. Um, so they would have, if we were, if this were a chart of like the bond energy as opposed to the free energy, then you would see that if something had a high enthalpy, it would be like high up. Whereas something with a low enthalpy is going to be lower down. So what we're caring about is the change in enthalpy. And so we have to take into account basically like the bond energies of all the bonds in the reactants and all the bonds in the products. And we're kind of like comparing which are more favorable. So if our products have more favorable bonds than the reactants, then we're going to overall have a, um, we're gonna overall have a negative delta H, which is going to mean that we are releasing heat into the surroundings. We're letting off heat. We are going to be exo, we're going to be exothermic. If our reactants are more favorable in terms of their bonds. Um, so if they have like happier, more stable, lower energy bonds, then they're going to um, basically, if for the reaction to happen, we're going to have to add some heat. Um, so it's going to be endothermic. Um, it's going to take in heat from the surroundings. Things can get kind of confusing because we have to define a system where we have like our system, um, and the surroundings, so like the system where, where things are actually taking place and then like the surroundings. Um, and so we have everything's in comparison. Um, and so this is, um, the terms can get kind of confusing, but you have to note that when we're talking about, um, when we're talking about like a reaction being endothermic or exothermic, if it's endothermic, it's taking in heat from the surroundings and so the surroundings are gonna feel colder. If it's um, exothermic, exothermic, it's going to be giving off heat to the surroundings. So it might feel colder, um, but the surroundings will feel hotter. And so it all has to depend on what you're actually like feeling and what you're um, measuring and stuff. So things can get kind of confusing because you're always going to have to add some um, energy in order to break bonds. Um, but you are going to then have to take into account that you might be gaining some energy um, in the bond, the new bonds that you make. So it's all a comparison of your reactants to your product. If your products have more stable bonds, they're going to have a um, lower enthalpy than the reactants. So if you're subtracting the bigger thing from a smaller thing, you're going to get a negative number. And so if you have a negative change in enthalpy, this is going to mean that your products basically have kind of like happier bonds than the reactants. They're more stable. And this makes sense, right? That this would be help you be your re reaction be more favorable, help your reaction be more thermodynamically favorable, have a lower delta G, is that if it's making bonds that are more stable, then it's less likely to go backwards, right? It's less likely to go and make those less stable bonds. Um, and so a negative dental G is good. And so this is basically like, so if you were to go to another couch and you were less squirmy on that other couch, it was easier to get comfortable, then you wouldn't, you'd be less likely to go back to the first couch, right?
But of course, then you also have to take into account entropy. So maybe that other couch is really, really nice and squishy, but you can't spread out. And so you really have to take into account both the entropy and the enthalpy when you're deciding whether or not a reaction is spontaneous. And another thing to mention is that the temperature is going to come into effect. So basically, you can think about maybe that the temperature is going to um, is multiplying by the um, by the entropy. So basically, the effects of the entropy are going to be greater at the higher temperature. Um, and so this is kind of like when it's hotter, you're going to want to um, spread out more. So you're going to care more about the entropy. Um, and so the entropy is going to be amplified by the temperature. And so the temperature can also influence this reaction. Um, but in any case, we're talking about having a negative delta G as being a good thing. Um, a negative delta G is going to mean a reaction is exergonic. It's going to release energy. So if we want to have a negative delta G, the best thing we can do is to have a reaction that is exothermic. So it lets off heat and it has an entropy gain. So it gives you more disorder or more randomness, more ways to spread out on your couch. Um, so you're less squirmy and you can spread out more. That's good. Um, and so this is going to be the most um, favorable type of reaction because it's favorable at like all temperatures. These two will, will depend on the temperature and this one is always going to be uh, non-spontaneous, um, non-thermodynamically favorable. Um, but when we're talking about our party popper reaction, we're going to be in this corner. It's going to be exothermic. It's going to let off heat. Um, and it is going to be, um, which is why it kind of like feels warm when you're um, touching like the surroundings around what's going on in there. Um, and it's going to be an, um, have increased entropy. So you can think about all that confetti shooting out. Um, you have a lot of entropy because you're, what you're doing is you're generating a gas and this is going to be um, a gas molecules can move out around a lot more than when you have like solid molecules all stuck together. So let's talk about the reaction that's actually going on. Um, so as I mentioned before, this is going to be a redox reaction. Um, and so redox refers to oxidation and reduction. Um, so we talked a lot more about this in other posts, so um, you can check those out if you are um, confused about the concepts. But the basic idea is that all of the atoms that we're talking about, um, they're going to be made up of smaller parts called subatomic particles. And these include positively charged protons, which hang out with neutral neutrons in the dense central nucleus, which is surrounded by this cloud of negatively charged electrons. Um, when these atoms link, they can link together by sharing pairs of electrons and what we call covalent bonds. When they do this, they kind of merge part of their electron clouds. So these shared electrons can kind of move between one and the other. So they're kind of like floating around in this cloud. And if you're more, sometimes they're more likely to hang out with by one of the atoms in the bond than the other. This is what happens, for example, in water. Um, so wa in water molecules, the oxygen is kind of, it's more electronegative. It hogs the electrons that it's sharing with the, ox with the hydrogen. This is gonna make the oxygen partly negative, the hydrogen is partly positive, and we call this polarity, and it's why water is really sticky and stuff. Um, but it also, um, gets us to this term, um, this like oxidation and reduction. So basically we, what we can say is that there's this thing called the oxidation number, which is more technical than I want to get in here. But basically it says that like, if you were to break these apart, who would the electron stay with? Um, and so it's gonna stay with the more electronegative atom. Um, and so oxygen is really electronegative. And so if you form a bond to an oxygen, basically what you're going to say is that you are going to um, be oxidized. You're going to be gaining, um, you're going to be losing electrons because the oxygen is basically hogging the shared electrons. Whereas if instead you form a bond to like hydrogen, which isn't very electronegative, then you would get to keep that electron if you were to split up. So we would say that you would be um, 
being reduced, you're gaining electrons. And so it doesn't have to be like full electrons. It can also just be like partial electron density, um, but it can also be like full electrons when we're talking about metals and stuff. Sometimes you'll see like full electrons moving. Um, but in biochemistry, we're often talking about just like change in electron density and stuff. Um, but the basic idea is that if you have oxidative electrons pulled away um, or you're losing whole electrons, it's going to be oxidation. Um, if you gain the electrons or you get to share more of the electrons when you form a bond, then you're going to be reduced. And these have to go hand in hand because if something's getting oxidated, oxidized, something else is getting reduced and, if, um, and vice versa. So commonly, oxidate, because as we said, like oxidate, oxygen is really electronegative. So usually if you form a bond to an oxygen, you're being oxidized. And um, if you form a bond to like a hydrogen, you're being reduced. Um, so we can actually, we can look at, there's like electronegativity trends. Um, and so the most electronegative things are going to be in this upper right corner. So you can see the oxygens over here, it's really electronegative. Um, and so some of the things that, so when something, anything that is less electronegative than oxygen, if it binds to oxygen, it's going to be oxidized. If we look at our party popper reaction, so our oxidant, the thing that is going to be oxidizing something, so it itself is going to be reduced. So it's going to be gaining electrons um, because it's basically making something else lose electrons. Um, and so our oxidant is going to be potassium chlorate, which we're going to decompose with a little heat in order to give us free oxygen that can then act um, to oxidize these. What we're going to be oxidizing is antimony trisulfide and um, phosphorus. So we can oxidize antimony trisulfide to antimony oxide. So you can see it's forming these bonds to oxygen and um, the phosphorus, phosphorus five oxide. Um, and then we also form like sulfur dioxide um, from our antimony trisulfide. And so in all of these cases, what we're talking about, so we have our antimony, we have our sulfur, um, we have our potassium. When they're bonding to oxygen, they're being oxidized because oxygen is more electronegative than them. So if they were to split up, the oxygen would get to keep the electrons. That's what we're saying with the, when we talk about in terms of oxidation numbers. Um, and the oxidation numbers, um, these are also what these like numbers here are referring to are like the oxidation states, um, but don't need to worry about that really to understand all of this. Um, so this, this reaction is going to be um, favorable. Um, so this is the overall reaction. Um, it happens like stepwise, but overall it's going to be exergonic. Um, and so it's going to give off energy. It's going to be exothermic. It's going to give off heat. And it's going to be um, entrop entropically favorable because you're making a gas. So all of these are solids. All the stuff we start with are solids and we end up with a gas. And when you have a gas, the molecules can move a lot more freely. Um, so you get this entropy gain. So overall the reaction is exergonic and the energy it's is um, going to be used to shoot out the confetti. But we need to get over, though this is, Exergonic overall, we actually need to do, we have like an endergonic step. We need to decompose this potassium chlorate um, and to release the um, oxygen. We also need to get the phosphorus in a more reactive state. So we have phosphorus here, but phosphorus can exist in like different states. And so it's kind of like the carbon allotropes we talked about with coal. Um, you can talk about phosphorus atoms like being linked up in different ways. So we're talking about just like pure phosphorus here, but they have different linkages. So the kind that is actually like on that paper is what we call red phosphorus. Um, and so it can be, it forms like these, um, it forms like this longer chains type of thing um, where you have these tetrahedral arrangements, but you can have like chains of them. Um, and so this is more stable, but it's less reactive and it's more stable because it, it's like the tetrahedral forms that are going to be more reactive. These like individual tetrahedral forms, this is like white phosphorus. So if we can break a little bit of this up into white phosphorus, then it's going to be more reactive. And so part of the reason why when you're like the friction that you add is going to be helping break these up to produce the white phosphorus. 
the friction is also going to be adding the energy that's needed to help this uh, potassium chlorate decompose, to end up um, releasing this molecular oxygen. Um, these oxygen-oxygen bonds are fairly weak, um, unstable, high energy. So when you use them um, to, um, so they're easier to break. And when you break them, so you take less energy in order to break them. And then once you break them, you're able to form these more stable bonds. So you're going to have an enthalpic benefit from forming these bonds compared to those bonds. And so our delta H is going to be negative overall for this reaction. So you kind of get this like reinforcing positive cycle where the, um, you, the energy is helping the potassium chlorate decompose, which is releasing more oxygen, which is oxidizing more of the phosphorus. And this is releasing more energy. It's going to be helping break up more of the potassium chlorate um, and on and on and on. And so this reaction can kind of keep itself going. So, Here's, I found this really good um, open source article about like why combustion reactions are always exothermic. Um, and the basic idea is that when you have your oxygen oxygen bond, um, that's going to be like a weaker bond. Um, and so when you break that bond, you're going to be in for more stable products, you're going to have this energy, um, you're going to have this entropy, this enthalpy gain. Um, so yeah, don't worry about the units here. Um, it's kind of confusing. Um, um, they're doing things in terms of like electron pair bonds and then in terms of like the enthalpy of formation instead of enthalpy of combustion and that sort of thing. Um, so it can get kind of confusing. But here, just think about like the lower energy is more stable. And so when you have your reactants and you have your products, you're going to have to go through a, um, you're going to have to have a little activation energy in order to break these, but then you're going to end up with more stable products. Um, and so since you have these more stable products, this is going to be, um, this is going to have a negative delta H because if you have a, um, smaller thing minus the bigger thing you're going to get a, um, a negative thing. And so if we look at our reaction, we can basically say, so we have this enthalp, we have this entropic gain because we have, we're generating this gas. Um, you can also get like entropic gains if you're like having more molecules or that sort of thing. Um, and, but basically, um, so we have that, that going on in our favor as well. Um, but the basic idea is that this is going to, um, these bonds are going to be lower energy, more stable bonds. And so they're going to have an, will have an enthalpic benefit of forming them, even though we had to break some of these um, bonds in order to do so.